Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, we, we started this analysis from a, a Mediterranean angle, um, so a regional perspective, but um, it became quite um, sort of immediately clear that the, the implications of this investigation had a sort of much wider uh, sort of relevance also for the, uh, uh, you know, the North Atlantic domain. So I'm gonna use this kind of the, the Mediterranean as a sort of Trojan horse to get into the, the Atlantic domain, so to say. Uh, this is not surprising because we know that the Mediterranean multidecadal variability is sort of enslaved to what happens in the neighbor Atlantic domain. And so there's a vast body of literature showing how, I mean, correlated is the low frequency fluctuations in the Mediterranean area with the um, Atlantic multidecadal variability, uh, particularly showing for the sea surface temperature, um, evaporation fields, and also uh, temperature of the air temperature over land. Um, so uh, the, the, this evidence somehow points to the predictability of the signal. We, I mean, is this, the, the question is, is this really predictable and, and how? I mean, if we look at the, um, when we try to establish how predictable is this sea surface temperature variability um, um, by using, for example, CIMIC-5 decadal predictions, this is a picture from a work by Virginie Gemma and the recent, recent work showing what is the added value of initialized versus non-initialized, uh, you know, um, uh, simulations and there are differences in the uh, anomaly correlation and uh, telling you what is the advantage of uh, in you know climate predictions with respect to more standard historical sort of uh, uninitialized uh, simulations and you see there are some differences the yellow patches show where there is this added value but this is relatively small it's significant is there you can see it's quite confined to some sub-areas of the Med Sea, and in particular in the Levantine, Mediterranean, uh, Eastern Mediterranean Basin. But it, it, to some extent, this is also telling us that most of the, the skill, the predictive skill, is already in the uninitialized simulation. So we can get a lot of predictability even without an initialization. So it's telling us that, um, that there's some important role, not only from the uh, you know, internal variability of the system, the uninitialized component, but there's also um, some uh, important role potentially for the forcings. Um, and so this led us to the major question of what is the role of the forcing? Uh, by forcing, I mean, I'm meaning here natural uh, and anthropogenic forcings. And what is the role of the forcing on the overall predictability uh, that we see in the, in the Med Sea region in the Mediterranean area? So to tackle this issue, we decided to, to use a sort of hier hierarchy of different historical integrations. Uh, ranging from more standard historical ones that we know of, very familiar with the, uh, the, 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 the ones which include the whole set of four things, natural plus anthropogenic. And, but we also tried, to decided to uh, use another typology of uh, historical simulations using uh, the so-called HIST uh, Michelin, HIST MISC uh, sort of integration. This is a, a type of a subset of semi five historical integrations where uh, specific forcing had been used, like uh, either using uh, individual anthropogenic forcings or specific, you know, natural forcings such as solar uh, uh, or volcanoes and so forth. And I need to give credit for collecting this in interesting set of uh, um, simulation to the NASA group in particular, who made a lot of work to collect this, this kind of uh, and coordinating this. Uh, sort of uh, MIP uh, in the CIMIC-5. Um, and so we're going to use also this uh, historical Michelinus with uh, uh, either anthropogenic only, just to, I mean, uh, disentangle what is the relative role of anthropogenic versus, you know, natural and anthropogenic together. And, and finally, um, in order to further narrow down our attention to which particular anthropogenic might be, we, we also used another subset, uh, even narrower subset of models where um, essentially all of four things are there, natural plus anthropogenic, except for the anthropogenic aerosol, the so-called no AA um, 
uh, simulations. And just to remind us, what we know very well, what do we mean by natural, do, what do we mean by anthropogenic? Natural here include no volcanoes plus solar variability, and anthropogenic is a blend of different four things going from greenhouse gases, anthropogenic aerosols, land use changes on the zone. Um, and, okay, so this is the size of the ensembles that we've been using. Um, so, as I say, historical simulations uh, provide quite a large body of simulations. In here, we decided to stick to those models which had provided ensembles of historical simulation, not just one individual single realization, but a number of it. And we decided to stick to those which had provided a minimum set of three members. And so this led us to select only 13 models. There are many more, but, of course, uh, the models which had provided the ensembles had um, a, lot, um, uh, a smaller set of the whole set. And this uh, amounts to about 69 different uh, historical realizations. The HISMISC with only anthropogenic forcings is still, I mean, quite large to some extent. It's 53 different ensembles. Uh, sorry, ensemble members overall, um, divided by uh, 10 different models. And finally, this is a much smaller set, unfortunately, of hist historical Michelinus uh, forcings without anthropogenic aerosols, which is amounts to 14. Only three models did that. Uh, but, and, that and that is the, the sort of site that we had to deal with. But as for historical and anthropogenic only, uh, it was quite a reasonably large set of uh, integrations. Um, now, if we look at the, at the historical simulation, this is, um, um, this is the sea surface temperature uh, record uh, for the uh, 20th century. Actually, it goes from 1870 up to 2010. And the black curve is the observations. And the gray cloud is the whole set of historical integrations. Um, this, and the, the red curve is the multimodal ensemble average made across the whole set of, you know, the grand ensemble of all the force, all, all the force of simulations. And what you see here, well, first of all, you can see that the cloud is encompassing the observations so that when you, you the, the, the models are somehow able to capture, I mean, the variability uh, of the, the real variability, the observed variability is included in the cloud. But most interestingly, the, the red curve is the multimodal ensemble mean. And after you average over such a large number of uh, simulation, you expect this signal to be essentially the forced component by averaging out the internal variability of individual models. And so the interesting point that you can see here is that um, after averaging over such a large ensemble of integration, you see, the, you see that it is uh, quite a good, in particular for the second half of the 20th century, there's a reasonably good uh, correlation with the observations. And uh, um, in particular, if you look at this uh, sort of a warm to cold transition occurred from the 50s to the middle uh, 70s, there is uh, this declining trend which is still there after such a large ensemble average. But you can also notice that there is a sort of mismatch in the phase, and the models, in a rather systematic way, tend to anticipate this minimum by uh, quite a few years with respect to the observed ones. Uh, whereas not such good agreement is in, in, the, in, the, in the first part of the record, actually um, there is some good agreement in the uh, late uh, 19th century, but then it becomes a bit more elusive during the early part of the 20th century. Um, uh, so when we try to um, establish what is a spatial structure associated in particular to this particular cycle, we decided to focus on, uh, on this uh, um, specific uh, semi-cycle of the OM, you know, AMV-like uh, variability. And in, you see if you composite, you know, uh, across the warm phase, uh, sorry, I can't see. Okay. If I composite across the warm phase about 20 years from 19... 30 to 1950s minus the cold phase of this semicycle and the, um, the, 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 the multimodal ensemble mean uh, sort of composite is uh, a pattern which shows of quite a familiar structure with this comma-shaped um, uh, structure and the sort of polar uh, basin amplified response and the Atlantic is uh, clearly part of it and it's uh, eastward uh, 
um, all on, the, on the European African seaboard, we have this sort of comma shape, and there's a cold lobe over the subtropics. If you do the same exercise for the OBS, you see a sort of a grossly a consistent pattern, again, we need to bear in mind that this is not the whole AMO, this is not the AMV pattern as we are used to see it, because it's only about one specific semicycle of it. So there's a lot of also noise, uh, noise, it's not noise, this is, uh, uh, um, I mean, since this is the reality in a way, we cannot filter out the internal variability from the forced one. But this is only the forced component. And, and even after removing sort of the internal variability, the forced component uh, bears some good consistency with the observed pattern. Um, so, okay, so the question is that, I mean, having said that, of course, historical forcings include both natural and anthropogenic forcings. And the question is, to what extent is this a, give, due to the, some natural forcings or due to some uh, more anthropogenic uh, forcings? Um, so in order to address this question, of course, we moved through, through the hierarchy of models from purely historical to sort of idealized um, anthropogenic only forcings. So this is the, uh, so I'm invoking here the historical MISC uh, set of simulations with only anthropogenic forcings. So everything which is anthropogenic is there, basically greenhouse gas, aerosols, ozone, land use, and so forth. And uh, well, now the issue here is the following. We, we can clearly see each of uh, these two curves and the blue one and the green one um, are uh, multimodal ensemble mean themselves. And they have been obtained from a fairly 50-50 partition in this population of models. There are about 27 models, no, there are 27 models in the blue one and 26 in the green one. And what is the difference between these two clusters? So clearly, this is a clusterization of the behavior of the models under anthropogenic conditions. And, uh, and the clusterization is such that the green one clearly reproduces this uh, um, SST dip, this minimum during the middle 70s, and then the, the temperature after that grow again. And whereas the so-called anthropogenic A is the blue curve, the temperature just monotonically increase, although there's a clear change in the pace of the growth as the trend changes and in the, in the latest part of the record accelerates, uh, quite consistent with the other ensemble. But it is clear that we have an issue here as not all the models, despite the fact that all the models have been forced presumably in the same way, in a consistent way, this is a protocol, um, then yet there is a large model to model uncertainty. But I can anticipate that this comparison is only partly fair because actually the blue curve is strongly biased by one specific model. There are, in terms of the model interdependence, this population are quite diverse in that the blue one is quite affected by one specific model, which has been run under very different configurations. But the model interdependence in the blue one is strongly biased one, one specific model. I'm not going to say which one is not interesting, or if you want, I can tell you. But I mean, this is just to say that the green curve is somehow representative of a more diverse uh, zoology of models. Um, Right, so, and if we overlap the historical forcings of this one, so this is the, the red curve that we were looking at before in the early, earlier slides, and you can clearly see that the historical and this particular subset of anthropogenic forcings um, quite overlap quite well, thanks, for the, in the second half of the century, and you can see that um, also, another feature that you will notice only once you overlap observations as well is that under anthropogenic, you still don't reconcile this mismatch in the phasing of the minimum of this particular warm to cold transition. Um, so anthropogenic and historical are quite consistent over there, and this is suggesting that it is actually, I mean, aside from this consideration in the model uncertainty, there's a quite a good I mean, uh, agreement between uh, uh, one particular subset of anthropogenic simulations and historical ones, that, which lead us to believe this is, according to this picture, this seems to be really anthropogenically driven, at least this particular uh, part of the cycle. We cannot say, we cannot make such a good attribution for the earlier part of the record, and uh, we see not obviously the anthropogenic don't seem to be playing any role as expected in the earlier part um, of the, um, the, say, the earlier part of the record, but not even the historical ones are capable to do that, uh, except that you can see that there is some influence in the volcanic 
uh, from, due to the volcanoes in the historical, which is absent, of course, by definition in the atropogenic ones because uh, the, no volcanoes are there by construction. Um, so, right, and then we look at the spatial structure of this, um, and again, of this uh, warm to cold transition, we show, again, the composite for all set of models that we've been looking at uh, so far, and you see the, 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 the green frame at the uh, plot is the one referring to the so-called anthropogenic B, the one showing the cooling, and the, the anthropogenic A is the one of the models that just the temperature keep on increasing. And you can see is that the, the green models, um, yeah, coming, the, the green models uh, patterns show, is a, it's again, it's the comma shaped uh, pattern comes out again with the subpolar amplified response and the Atlantic part of this uh, uh, large scale structure and the negative lobe of the subtropics, whereas anthropogenic A is the models which do not show any such as a cooling and that the temperature just keep on increasing and that of course the pattern is totally um, different. Um, so, okay, if it were anthropogenic, what kind of anthropogenic would that be? And then, okay, on a very purely intuitive basis, you wouldn't think that the greenhouse gas could determine such, uh, uh, let's say, a higher tools of the middle 20th century. Um, to make a, a fair comparison, we, find, we decided to use this uh, no anthropogenic aerosols, those models that we could rely upon, and uh, compare those to the historical ones, but only to those models corresponding exactly to, exactly to the no AA ensemble. So the, we, we just stick to those three models, and we confront the historical versus no anthropogenic aerosol, and you see that after you remove anthropogenic aerosol, this is the green, uh, so to, um, the green belt of the model uh, in, the, in the picture, the, the temperature increase, and they don't show any hiatus anymore. So it looks like they effectively the anthropogenic aerosol have played a role in this sort of inversion in the, in the trends of the temperature. And finally, I will skip conclusion. This is just kind of summary. I mean, we, the, the emerging picture is okay. This is this nice cycle, this AMV-like cycle, appears to be somehow, as a fortuitous, not fortuitous, but it looks like more a patchwork of different, I mean, sources of variability and predictability. And uh, um, if we cannot attribute the earlier part of the record to any forced response, that clearly internal variability is playing a role there. There's also concur from the volcanoes. Um, so I would say, but the second cycle of, of it, the second part of it, seems to be much related to the anthropogenic aerosol. And this leads us to the kind of Frankenstein A and B-like structure where different, you know, we're merging together different things, but overall contribute to uh, create this, uh, this nice sinusoidal-like picture. And I will stop here. Thank you. <laughs>